Hello, and welcome to the Ask Your Industry podcast, episode 64. For those of you new to the show, this is the podcast where I interview the most influential people from the world of stand-up, comedy, TV, and today, radio. Julia McKenzie is an executive producer at BBC Radio 4. She started her career at KISS FM and then moved into BBC Radio and has produced shows with Danny Baker, Joe Brand, Mel and Sue and many, many more, including The Jason Bine Show, Ian de Montfort Is, Unbelievable and French and Saunders for Radio 2. She knows her stuff, she knows what makes good radio for Radio 4. We talked about how the BBC picks and what it commissions, the gender and ethnic quotas on TV and if they exist in radio, the process from an idea landing in their lap to going out live on the air and the steps that are in place internally to make that happen and if the cliched radio for audience stereotype is accurate and more if you want to follow along you can find the show notes on my website which is simonkane.co.uk forward slash rc industry podcast and please don't forget to join the facebook group it's called rc industry podcast and it's on facebook obviously that's the best place to find out when the next guests are going to be coming on and you get to ask your questions to the influential people from the industry without any more delays this is Julia McKenzie. So uh, my job title is Executive Editor of BBC Radio Comedy. Um, that doesn't make much sense to most people that don't really know what that is. So uh, it really is, I'm Head of Radio Comedy. I run the in-house radio comedy department at the BBC. So we make approximately 70% of Radio 4's comedy output. A bit of stuff for Radio 2. We've got a group of around about 12 producers and six production coordinators. So between us, we make a lot of content ranging from topical shows like News Quiz and Now Show, Dead Ringers, through to stuff with brand new acts like Tez Ilias, for example. And and so you're in charge of commissioning that stuff or just producing that stuff? or Producing it. So I oversee all of our development and what we offer to the commissioner, who's Sean Ed William, uh, who's the Radio Force Comedy Commissioner. But we compete with indies for that business. So we have a sort of self-commission thing where I might say let's commission a script to develop that project further but we still have to go to the network effectively and give them what they want. So it's, so it's kind of a board decision of, of like what goes through or is it? In terms of our department? Yeah. Uh, well we'd have this thing called the PDG which is a programme development group which is a monthly thing where producers if they've got an idea they submit it to that and then I'll sit on that with the two editors and, and a guest producer, and we collectively discuss it. I suppose I, you know, ultimately have the veto over it, and it's it's all about having that good relationship with the commissioner, knowing what she is after, uh, anticipating what what might tickle her, and then trying to encourage producers to try to go towards that. In terms of what you're looking for for a show, do you have like quotas for you know a certain? We need sort of a certain genre of comedy in this slot a certain uh, uh, I know there's, there was that thing with panel shows for example with gender so I, I just wondered if there's like uh, a certain amount of slots you have for uh, I don't know like mm. slapstick comedy or, or sketch comedy or how does, how does it break down to what you have to sort of fit around in terms of the commissioning uh, I don't know bill as it were yeah, well, there's there's three main slots on Radio 4 where there's comedy. So 11.30 in the morning, 6.30 tea time and 11pm at night. And the 6.30 tea time is the one we've probably got the biggest audiences, 1.8 million roundabout. And that tends to be the more mainstream stuff that will cut through at that time of day, depending on what people are doing, whether in the car or at home or whatever. Um, and, and that can be a variety of stuff from panel shows through to audience sitcoms. Um, and the morning and the evening have their own different textures but it's not to say that the morning only has you know sitcoms or 6 30 only has panel shows or 11 o'clock at night only has experimental stuff that can be across the board you can find stand-up and sketch and uh, topical shows and uh, sort of illustrated lectures popping up across all of those things and you mentioned about the women on panel shows that was a particular issue in tv where you know david cohen decided he had to sort of um not david cohen um danny cohen <laughs> david cohen's a comedy writer um, uh, Danny Cohen decided that he had to sort of lay down the law a bit because I guess the gentle nudging wasn't really resulting in a more diverse uh, people on panels but we haven't really had that issue so much in radio because we've got a lot of female fronted shows and we also just believe it's a better show with women on it really so our panel shows generally will have uh, half and half
Mm. And in terms of the sort of a, a cliched joke that on the circuit of what the Radio 4 audience is, mm. would you say that would be an accurate, or, or do you think that's sort of something that's just sort of changing or, or adapting, especially with the technology that you're kind of implementing with on-demand stuff and, and podcasts? And Yeah. Well, what do you think the, the cliché is about the Radio 4 audience? <laughs> the, the Radio 4 audience cliché that I keep seeing is sort of, uh, I'd say, 30 to 45-ish um, kind of professional who sort of doesn't really watch as much TV. They listen to more radio than, than, than TV and is, is more listening to it on the go than, than sort of wanting to sit down and actually consume like a, a passive TV show. Mm. That's, that's the kind of cliché that I've... That, that people sort of play to on the circuit that I see. Right. Is there another one you see? Or uh, so? Well, I suppose it's it's a diverse audience. Millions of people listen to Radio 4, and it's a very eclectic network. Mm. Um, you know, the average age is around about sort of 50 plus, um, but uh, they also are, are appealing to the 30-somethings, uh, and comedy in particular brings in a younger audience. So I think that um, although on demand and, and sort of curating your own listening is obviously on the increase, um, it's still an extraordinarily high amount of people listen live, actually. Uh, and it's that sh- shared experience uh, of doing that and that sort of companionship throughout the day. You know, a lot of people who do listen on demand will catch up with stuff, you know, on, on the podcast. Like we have something like the Friday Night Comedy Podcast, which is usually one or two in the podcast charts. And that's the one where we have our topical shows every week. And that's a bit of an appointment for people to subscribe to those. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people, when you said cliche, I thought you were going to say it's all about the archers and the news and it's very middle class <laughs> and twee, uh, which I've heard before. And, you know, some of the content is, you know, we'd call it middle class, uh, which is perfectly fine, but people's um, precon- preconceptions aren't often borne out by the content. And we have a lot of really quite uh, unusual and uh, challenging comedians who work with us, people who they're very surprised when they realise that they're on Radio 4 and we, we try to push boundaries. You know, it's adult content, it's an adult network. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of comedians who do stuff for Radio 4 that would be a surprise to a lot of people who don't listen to Radio 4. Would it be, because I've spoken to uh, David Quantic a little while ago, who's done radio and TV, and he said obviously it's it's slightly easier to do t- uh, radio work, not as in uh, like as in production or anything, but in terms of getting it through because it's obviously less cost in terms of production uh, equipment and all that kind of stuff. And in terms of pushing boundaries, do you think that's Im- embedded into that in the sense that y- you're, a lot of it's in the mind of the listener. As a result, you can sort of play more with words because you're not having to graphically show something that might be edgy or whatever it would be. Yeah, definitely. I think there's a lot of truth in that. Um, you know, yes, the production teams are very small, so you have an intimate relationship as a producer with the artist or writer, and that's a, a great thing. In TV, if you're doing stuff in front of an audience, I mean, you're, the crew is absolutely massive, and there's lots of people who have a vested interest in decision makings, which you know, which can make it a bit frustrating. There's a certain purity in ra- radio and that creative relationship. Uh, yes, it's not as expensive. Radio Four isn't a wash with money, so every, every penny counts. But you know, relatively speaking, it's not as expensive. So the stakes aren't as high as they are in TV, where they're having to get all sorts of additional investment. Yes, it's also true to say that you can go anywhere with your imagination. So you know, the, the show Daphne sounds expensive, which was on recently, a, a sketch act trio. They're sort of going for modern-day goons, and the idea is that the show sounds really expensive because of the locations they're going to and the people who are involved, and they have a, a live band on stage. But, of course, they can be in the jungle one moment, they can be in a helicopter the next, and that is that versatility that you can do on radio and the listener goes with you, whereas on TV, people go a bit pale and say, really, a helicopter? Mm. So, you know, or, or period stuff is another mm. example that's very difficult to do on TV because it's so expensive with the sets, but uh, on radio, we, we've got a lot of flexibility. I just r- recently did a play... Uh, with the Penny Dreadfuls who are a comedy sketch group and uh, we've done about six of those and the most recent one was set aboard the HMS Beagle Darwin's first journey as as a naturalist and so you know you can create wonderful textures all with sound effects and scoring and also you've got your part of BBC Studios or you're you're linked to that how does that relationship work? 
Yeah, so BBC Studios is basically like a sort of restructuring of the BBC to enable the in-house production to not just make content for the BBC but make it for other places as well. So TV-wise, that would be Channel 4, ITV, Sky, Netflix, whatever. Uh, and um, we, in radio, have always been part of TV comedy. So we will join them in BBC Studios uh, with, with drama and entertainment. And hopefully it will open a few doors for us in terms of you know thinking about podcasting other commercial activities we're obviously an important part of the tv setup because we we nurture talent and grow talent and help talent find their voice and so then we can suggest a, a career path into tv as well so you know for all intents and purposes not a great deal changes but april next year is when we slightly separate out so we're still owned by the bbc but being part of this bbc studios entity is is almost like we're a sort of super indie as it were Mm. but owned by the bbc so we'll still expect to be the main supplier to the bbc but we'll be able to you know get involved in slightly more commercial activity as well when you say uh move slight move more into tv Mm -hmm. i know a lot of performance is often that's sort of their goal as it's such because it's so because it gets so much exposure and it's so much sort of more prevalent in a, in a way mm. is it a case of you find a lot of radio comedians or writers want to move across or, or is it also the other way some people want to move from tv back to radio or not back but you know across to radio yeah sure um yeah i think both of those are true some people uh, for them the end goal is tv because you know uh the somehow the kudos is greater although you know the audiences are often really quite small on tv these days compared to those on radio i think that a lot of people don't realize that you are getting about 1.8 million on on the radio whereas some tv shows are lucky to scrape a few hundred thousand but you know there is a the more money and all the rest of it uh, it's sort of seen as more glamorous and that's a, a, if they want to go in that direction, we do all we can to help them. Uh, it's good to not go too early. So, you know, radio is very helpful for establishing the world, the place you want to talk about, uh, finding your voice, really honing those writing skills because you can't rely on any visual tricks. Uh, and so that when that's ready, it's it's hopefully a relatively painless transition. There are other people who come the other way. You're right. You know, they've done TV. They've uh, enjoyed it. Um, find it a bit of a pain in the bum sometimes, you know, because it's exhausting. It takes out, you know, sometimes, you know, weeks and weeks of your, your life to do it. And there is this sort of occasionally it's sort of production by committee. Mm. So they're quite happy to come back to radio and realise that it's quite liberating. So, you know, actors, for example, don't have to learn their lines, don't have to get covered in makeup and give up weeks of their life. Um, or writers just like the purity of it. So Alexi Sale, for instance, you know, quite an iconic figure. He has um, come back to do a, a series with us, a stand-up series, which he's recording at the moment. David Renwick, you know, ce- celebrated writer of One Foot in the Grave and Jonathan Creek, he's written a, a series for Jason... Uh, no, for David Jason, uh, for Radio 4. So, you know, there is quite a lot of that fluidity coming backwards and going forwards to radio and TV. And in terms of uh, opportunities for new writers and new performers, do you you scout for it? Or I I know uh, I spoke to Anne Edivin, who does the writer's room, Mm -hmm. and I know they've got like an open submission thing. And I know you have the the new new comedy competition and stuff. Are there... Are there lesser known ones? Because I know that one's very well known in the comedy community. Would you say that that's, that's the main way that you, you find out about new people to come into radio? Oh, well, there's lots of ways, really. Yeah, so there's the BBC Radio New Comedy Award, which we just had the final of just a few days ago in Edinburgh. So that's obviously designed for performers. So that's open to anyone. They can submit five minutes of audio, which I think we had about 700 entries, get, got whittled down to 60. We then had these regional heats, which then ended up with two two semi-finals and then six people in the final so that that's one way of it of doing it um the other way is you know anyone can send anything to any producers you know with email so if you listen to radio 4 and you like that comedy just listen out at the end and you'll hear a producer's name and either it'll say an indie uh, production company or it'll say bbc studios production and you can get in touch with a producer and say i liked your work would you consider something for me we also have an open door show news jack which is on 4 Extra, hosted by Nish Kumar. Anyone can write for that. That, for us, is an excellent source of new writers. So you don't need to be a writer-performer. It's mostly just writers. So that's writing topical jokes and sketches. And they have uh, two series of that a year, and they have quite 
detailed briefing on the website. Uh, you can follow them. I think it's at BBC News, Jack. And they will give full details of how you can write to that. And you, if, if it gets on air, you get paid. So that's all very nice. And that's a great way for us uh, of, of meeting new writers. It's been a, a really vital pipeline for us, News Jack. And, like, what's the... I don't want to say pick up rate but like obviously because there's only a certain a number of slots there's only a certain number of people you can take on like how how far ahead are you planning for example so in the next year mm-hmm. do you already have like your schedule picked up so if I so if there was if I was to email you an idea for example would it be me emailing you to say I'm I've got this idea for spring next year type thing or is it quite so how, how long are the lead times and things like that Especially if, because if it's a news joke, obviously your joke could be out next week because it's so topical. But it, but if you were sending an idea to a producer, which I think a lot of people wouldn't think to do necessarily, because we, I think we'd think that would annoy you a bit, mm. especially if you've got hundreds of emails. Yes, well, I, I mean, it might annoy me. Yeah, <laughs> there's every risk okay. of that if I Don't do email get hundred. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. I mean, it, but you know, it's just it, that's sort of our job, really, isn't it? The the only thing is with email, I just find that I just drown in them sometimes. Right. So someone might email me, and I'll look at it. And then I'll go and do something else or whatever. And then, you know, like a uh, covering of snow over footprints, uh, it's gone further down into my inbox. And I've forgotten about it because another 30 emails are coming all, all asking me to do things. So, you know, you have to be a bit persistent. Um, so, yeah, in terms of lead time, um, we just we had a results of our spring round recently. And so they were for shows from next April onwards. So when we have our next commissioning round, which will be spring next year, that's going to be for shows that will go out from April uh, 2018 onwards, which seems really far away. (laughs) uh, Having said that, um, you know, if you were to email me uh, this autumn and have this amazing idea, it does take a while to develop stuff, you know, and, and we would... Uh, develop it and possibly commission a pilot if it got to that and you know there's still a chance it could go on earlier than I've said stuff can drop out or I can go to to the commissioner and say we have this amazing thing I'm very I feel it has to go on now what can we do Mm. you know stuff that has that sort of urgent feel of it must go on now um, you know you can do your best to try and make space for that so it's best not to second guess the commissioning process that's our job really you know just come up with good ideas no, I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate of a comedian or a writer who isn't sure how to break into it in that way, you know, mm-hmm. because I think a lot of us, we, I mean, I'm very much of a DIY mindset of I want to make something, so I'll do something like this. But I know a lot of performers who sort of have something that they want to, to get on, maybe for the kudos or maybe for the money or whatever it works out as, but they're not sure of how to take it to you guys. And as you said, uh, every every industry person I've spoken to is drowning in emails. Like mm. it's not a it's 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 uh, and I can imagine us going through. I mean I've I've done it where like you know I've emailed a guest and and they've said yes and then a month later you've not heard anything and it's two days time and you sort of feel like I, I do want to check but I don't want to annoy them because I know they're so busy and I, I suppose I suppose what I'm asking for is what other than being nice and polite what would you say are like the the common mistakes people would make when they're trying to pitch you an idea or, or or try and get your attention? Uh, yeah. Um, well, I suppose the, the number one thing is listen to the output. So if it, it's always annoying when someone comes to you with something and they just clearly haven't really listened <laughs> to what you do, yeah. you know, because that just seems to me a basic courtesy and also just sort of really knowing your field. You know, you, you wouldn't... Um, try and design a pair of trousers for a, a trouser shop without checking out what trousers they've got already. Do you know what I mean? Um, and uh, that will mean that you're more in tune with the sort of stuff we like and the people we're working with. So you don't offer us something identical that we're already doing. And you get some sense of what, what the tone will be. Sometimes people send stuff which they think is, a per, in their view, a perfect Radio 4 thing. And it's just some sort of... I don't know, twee, awful thing that people just running around shouting a lot, you know, with, you know, set in a historical context and just think, oh, well, that's very Radio 4. And it's just like, well, no, that's, if that's your idea of what Radio 4 is, you haven't le- heard what we're doing and that's not going to really, um, you know, d- do the business for us. So it's li- listen to the output as much as you can so you're well as informed as possible. And then I suppose it just helps if you get in touch and say, I was listening recently to so-and-so, I thought it was really interesting, and, you know, that's the sort of comedy I'd like to make. I've got an idea. Uh, Would you 
be able to you know would would you be able to spare any time to if I was to email you more information you know I wouldn't necessarily send a script at the first off it's just establish that communication initially and then if they agree you send the paragraph through and then you should probably chase it up after a week and say oh, I appreciate you're very busy but have you had a chance to look at that paragraph and you you do just have to be persistent i think i mean not don't be sort of passive aggressive or whatever because you don't know what's happening in that person's sort of life or work but just sort of being professional and gently you know uh, persistent is probably what's going to get you that answer in the end and if someone ends up coming back and saying listen i'm sorry i just i'm too overwhelmed i i don't have time to see it, to read it hopefully they might suggest someone else who would you know but uh, I suppose it's you just there's no point in just sitting there through politeness, uh, just thinking, oh, I better not bother them. You know, you want to try and get a, an answer, don't you, really? Mm. But, you know, you can't expect that everyone with unsolicited stuff will have lots of time to read it and then give you notes. Mm. I mean, the other the other slightly annoying thing is when people send you what feels like a bespoke email and uh, ask you would you read this thing and then you do but then you've discovered that seven other colleagues in the <laughs> department have also received this bespoke email and just the names being changed at the top and what's a bit annoying about that is that if I decide to put aside an hour of my time to read something and then think about what I'm going to say to you and, and reply because that's not an easy thing you have to think carefully about how you respond if I find that seven other producers of mine have also put that time aside and we're all doing it with the best, you know, of intentions, it's just a waste of our time, really, mm. um, because I think it's just fair for one person to do that. So, I mean, you could sort of put your hand up and say, I've emailed a few people. Would you have any time? And then at least we know. But there's no good if all seven of us are, are putting time aside to come back to you on your thing. Yeah, of course. And it's, it's sort of, I get the scattergun approach, but at the same token, it's it's not respect like it, it it would set you off on the wrong foot to work with that person as well. Yeah, and I think you know you could f- you could forgive it. You can understand why it's done. It's just it just doesn't feel completely transparent, really. Mm. But often in departments, there might be someone who tends to be the person who reads the unsolicited script. So you know, it might be a case of calling up and finding out is there someone who you know is more on the development side of things, and they mm. can perhaps get you a quicker response. And, and in terms of picking ideas and trying to take them forward to the commissioner, how hard is it for you to like set aside maybe your own personal tastes on radio comedy and go with what obviously the needs of the department or the channel are? Is that like quite a balancing thing for you, or are you sort of always thinking about the channel and sort of not necessarily your own, or is, or is it always synced up quite nicely where your stuff has gone through because it's your your taste is quite in keeping with the channel itself? Yeah, I feel like my taste is very in keeping with with Sean Ed, who's the commissioner. I mean, there are there probably areas where you know she might like something and I thought, oh, I didn't like that, or and vice versa. But generally, we find that we are of the same opinion with certain stuff that we'll we'll hear or whatever and we'll both go oh dear or you know whatever so that's helpful there are some things when I that I, I do prefer it if I can personally champion everything we put through I want to be able to to look the commissioner in the eye and say why I think it's really good and why she should commission it but occasionally yeah my taste might not be to that but m- significant amount of people in the department disagree and think it's good so I will sometimes just just allow it to go through because I I sort of think this isn't my cup of tea but I might be proved wrong but I can see there's craft in it and all the rest of it and you know sometimes I am proved wrong and it and it is commissioned and other times I I'm proved right that my instinct was was correct and it's not the right thing but you know yes I will times when it's not quite my thing I will try and take other opinions and on balance put it through if I feel that you know it's got a chance on a devil's advocate point what would you say to a comedian or writer who has a sort of stigma or cynicism in their head that says you need like an agent to be seen or heard Mm. by by someone in the BBC yeah I don't really recognize that I do Although, you know, you do establish a relationship with certain agents and they might get in touch and say, would you have a look at this script or would you meet my client? You know, that that's fine. But I, I if I just got an email from someone who didn't have an agent with an idea or saying, come, come to this read through, I wouldn't 
uh, ignore them. I wouldn't think, oh, they haven't got an agent, I'm not interested, you know. Sometimes it can be very exciting to discover someone who hasn't got any representation, you know, because it means that they're they're pretty new on the block. And um, so, no, so that's not off-putting to me at all. And if you, if you had a bit of advice for either a comedian or a writer who has an idea, but so treatment-wise or, or script-wise, you said don't send that in straight away. Like that sort of just just get a get a conversation going before we even sort of see that going through. When you say you want to see something, are you specific in saying like so? For example, with with Anne, she was like, "Just send me the first ten pages because if you haven't made me laugh in that, there's no point in us doing this kind of thing." Is it that's what you'd ask for when you when you ask to speak see more about an idea, or would it be you just say send everything and and you'll just filter through what you want? Yeah, I, um, I suppose the reason I say don't send the script initially is that you know I just can't can't guarantee that I'm I'm going to read it you know um so it's sort of particularly if it if it's still at development stage so I'd rather someone sent me a few lines giving me the gist of it so that I can at that point go actually we do have a sitcom about clowns who share a house you know so I think there's going to be too much of a sort of conflict there so I think it's it's probably not for us so I can head off any clashes because you know we we're developing a hell of a lot of stuff and inevitably at some point there will be an overlap with with something that a new person wants to submit I never mind the stuff that indies are also getting on radio for um, sorry, I've forgotten the question. Well, there's, a, there's a follow-up thing, so I can move forward if you. Oh, okay, yeah. Want. So I've forgotten what you wanted me to um, say. It was it was a general question. Oh, yes, about, about oh, yeah, you know. And then I'll say if I might say, oh, I've got a big train journey coming up. So yeah, go on, send me that script then, you know. And then I'll have a look at that. But I don't. I, for me, I don't need to say, oh, just send me the set t- first ten pages of it. That I'll just see the full script. Yeah, yeah, and. Uh, do you do you listen to podcasts outside of the remit of the BBC stuff? Uh, yes, I try to. I know a lot of our producers uh, are big podcast listeners. I'm trying to think. Um, I just have so much radio that I have to catch up with, to be honest with you. Um, so, you know, I'm listening to stuff that producers have made that's going out. I'm listening to stuff that is... I'm having to sign off for compliance and catch up with TV comedy and all the rest of it. So I don't have huge amounts of time to listen to um, external podcasts as well. So if you know next question is have I got any favourites um, I don't consistently listen to other podcasts I'm, I must say I know I should do more of that I enjoy Adam Buxton's uh, podcast when I, when I can grab that I've heard wooden overcoats dip in uh, and out but often on the tube for instance you know which is a good time to listen to stuff I'm reading scripts so you know it's just a question of having the, the physical time to take on board all this extra stuff yeah I think I think something that I learn every day more and more is every Everyone has only 24 hours in the day and the amount of content that's going out is way more than 24 hours in a day. Yeah. And so you sort of have to really pick and choose your... T- you just have to value your own time, really. Yeah. And so I totally get that. My, my follow-up question was going to be, where do you see the future of radio going? Do you see it? Because like, you've mentioned a couple of times that the, the, the live listeners are still very high mm-hmm. versus the live watch, for example, on TV. And, I mean, do you, do you see it going more to, to... Like, are you taking ideas and putting them straight to on-demand rather than live? Because obviously there's only limited slots there or how how do you see that developing yeah I think it has to keep developing in that in that slightly more on demand space the I think what people have been loving is the the radio player app which is a BBC uh, the 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 radio version of the the BBC iPlayer and what's been great about that is you can download most radio shows now so that's really liberating because before you you just had you had to have wi-fi to hear them so you know that's obviously great and I think we're going to see that really sort of starting to change behavior as people just you know download a bunch of stuff and listen when it's more convenient to them there are rules with us with the bbc and how many things that we we can podcast you know because you might notice that not all of our shows are podcast and that is a sort of bbc trust thing it's about competition you know if we if we flooded the market with with a load of uh, podcasts um, i suspect that the wider industry wouldn't be best pleased so, so we have to be careful about that um We have been doing a daily podcast, the Edinburgh Fringe, and that's a new thing for us. And the restrictions around podcasting for us, BBC, is that it has to have been broadcast first or be used for broadcast. Uh, It can't just be... standalone podcast thing and so our fr- funny for the fringe is being used by the comedy club on four extra so they use 
uh, repurpose our, our content for that podcast. We do have something that we we are working on, which is a digital only uh, comedy commission, which is sort of using social media to tell a story. So that's a new thing for us, which is a sort of visualised type of, of audio comedy. So I think you know there will be more stuff to that. You know, we're trying to find you know clippable content and uh, trying to attract people who aren't already on the Radio 4 website to find our content and come to us and listen to the full length stuff so I do think it is inevitable that whilst live remains the significant uh, way that people you know most significant way that people listen to Radio 4 it will only you know evolve as time goes on. When someone sends in an idea are you re- or are you reading the idea uh, if you read the idea and you like it but you know you can't commission it would you look them up to see what they do to see if they are a fit for other things or are you only looking for ideas? Uh, yeah well it would be interested in seeing whether they could uh, uh, have any other use you know whether that's appearing in a sketch show or or writing on another show definitely yes if if i think this is a really funny idea but i just can't see that it's ready for radio yet i you know sometimes people send the odd clip you know or youtube link i mean don't send loads because that's a bit you know if you (laughs) don't send your hour (laughs) well you know you just sort of see sometimes you see a very long email with multiple clips and links in and just no one has the time to do that really so i think it's helpful if you edit yourself so if you cherry pick what what are my two best things that show me in the best light rather than just say his 27 things and I'll leave you to work out which of those you've got time for I think we need to see a little bit of self-selection going on Mm. and also that comes down to the research of who you're emailing because yeah if if I know you're interested in one-liner comedy and I'm a one-liner comedian I I should send you jokes in that vein rather than trying to pitch to everyone who maybe doesn't care about you know they prefer sketch yeah I mean if you're trying to get work on news Jack you probably want to send some examples of topical comedy rather than send you know an hour and a half long play you know so just yeah just sort of think sensibly yeah yeah definitely and and about your the the radio competition the, i mean the, the process of taking from 700 to 60 mm. I, that sounds like a mammoth task how like what's your criteria i mean i know on the website it's down to originality material delivery and all that kind of stuff do you do you are you able to like pinpoint a bit more is it just a gut feeling you get from the the little the clip that people send in or is it what's the kind of thing that goes through your mind when you're uh well i have certainly have listened to some of those in the past i didn't this year because i was judging on the semi-finals so i didn't want to sort of come with any baggage I think it is, you know, it doesn't make you laugh is really the first (laughs) thing, isn't it? You know, and I think I'm right in saying that three, there are three listens to every uh, audio piece uh, or it might be two, you know, so it's not just one person's taste, which is which is quite important, just so everyone gets a fair chance. I think, you know, that it just doesn't make you laugh has to be the first starting point, really. And you can't always analyse that. Then when if you've got a lot of people who are making you laugh, then you, you start applying other things like is that original or have I heard, you know, loads of other people do similar jokes in the similar territory, you know, because ultimately you want to end up with a spread of, of people who've got different sort of comedy styles. It's no good having you know six finalists who are all talking about not getting a girlfriend or whatever you know so yes you know originality confidence of performance you know surprising you know rather than sort of predictable very uh, sort of predictable observational stuff you know obviously these are people at the start of their careers so you have to factor that in it's not going to be the finished product uh, and it shouldn't be so uh, you accept a bit of rawness it doesn't need to be perfectly recorded but it should it should really make you laugh yeah it makes sense why you wouldn't want to listen and sort of keep the baggage aside from that but yeah. is it the same when you get them sent in because they can't obviously be anonymous because everyone has to send in their submission but do you research beyond the the clip like when they're doing the free the free listens through or is it literally just based on that one uh i suppose as as it gets whittled down more i think there's some stuff instinctively you just will reject you know or it might go in a maybe and then someone else will listen and get rejected uh, as it starts to go a bit smaller, there's probably a bit more research done because there are certain criteria. Uh, I can't quote the exact criteria, mm. but I think that we do have a restriction about how established a comic you are, mm. how many years in the in the industry you've been, just so that it feels a genuine opportunity for for newies. But you know, we accept that a lot of people might have been going for years just working at the weekends and evenings because they got a day job, and so you know, so we we tr- we try and sort of make it as flexible as possible. But yes, we would start to do a bit more research. And, and have a 
see. But 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 with a comedy, we do just judge it on that audio. We're not going to think that's not great. But I've just gone and found something they've done on YouTube, which is hilarious at twenty minutes. That's irrelevant. It has to be what they've submitted. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And and uh, very quickly looking at the future of radio again, what what is the like hardest challenge for you in terms of keeping up with like audience habits and and technology changing for like sort of adjusting uh, either content? I mean, do, do you find you have to adjust content, like especially when you take it from live to as in like a live play to the online medium, or are you? Is it like you said, it has to have been on there and then it just gets put straight into? Yeah, well, that's often the way it is. You know, it's it's gone out and then it's available to download immediately, and there are no changes. I suppose you know. If it's going to have a visual element, obviously you need to think differently. You know, if it's going to be in uh, cut up into smaller chunks and you've got some visualization, you've got to think about how people will be consuming it. You know, so much uh, uh, audio now is consumed on a mobile phone or a tablet. So if you do have an accom- accompanying visuals, you've got to think about will they be easy to to view on a on a phone. I don't think there's anything else particularly that. Uh, one would change because you know some people do anyway listen to radio with headphones on and have that very intimate experience of it Uh, whereas I know that obviously podcasts must be largely on headphones you know so there is perhaps you know there is a tendency for a more intimate storytelling type thing like the American podcasts favour that very sort of intimate storytelling style which perhaps we don't get quite so much on 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 radio Um, you know you have the likes of David Sedaris who are storytelling people but they have an audience there and, st- and we have some kind of soundscape you know like the John Kearns for instance former uh, Edinburgh Comedy Award winner he did 15 minute things which was sort of quite internal um, very sort of layered textured pieces uh, but yeah I can't really think of any major change that we'd make you know, I'm, I'm loving the fact that there's sort of this, uh, I say, boom in long form content because I've sort of, uh, for the last couple of years, noticed the, you know, tweets and, and microblogging just becoming a norm thing. But I'm finding that, especially with my audience, or especially with just general podcast friends of mine, the, the, the want for long form content, and it doesn't mean filler content or anything, it just means that you, you sort of had uh, something a bit more meaty to it is coming along and I, I, I feel like a limitation on, on live radio might I, I, I mean I, you, know, you can correct me if I'm wrong but if you've got like a time slot to it it sort of means that you kind of have an arc to work to so it sort of has a beginning middle and end whereas if you ha- didn't have a time limit which obviously has its downsides as well it sort of allows you to, to maybe do a little bit more in a different way yeah I think that's true you know yes we are occupying slots that are either 14 minutes long or 28 minutes long so when you get it as a download that's all you're going to get occasionally we do extended uh, cuts of stuff like for news quiz for instance it goes out at 28 minutes we do an extended version which is 43 which is available as a podcast uh, for four extra and that's been very popular um i think that I mean, it is interesting that a lot of uh, younger people do listen to a lot of podcasts and longer form stuff and they don't sort of realize that effectively what they're listening to is a form of radio uh, and yet they would never go to radio for for comedy you know they just sort of it's not on their radar at all i think they feel that what they're listening to is is sort of groundbreaking stuff this audio only narrative which is i think a challenge for us because we need to get to those people so they can hear our content i think there is some um great podcasting stuff there is also stuff that is very unproduced and is very rambly you know it's just sometimes it's just uh you know really uh dri- you know things that just sort of drift all over the place maybe that's what people like that sort of sound as a sense of eaves- eavesdropping on on a thing and um that's what they like but sometimes i think better production values would you know improve it but you know uh it, there, it is liberating to have a flexible duration that's certainly true for podcasts you know so you don't have to deliver it you know 27 minutes 50 seconds which is often what we do for radio 4 to be able to sometimes do it at 40 minutes and sometimes do it at 17 is is really nice and that's what we found with this um funny from the fringe podcast has been great but sometimes concision does enhance the comedy and uh giving that discipline of hitting certain points and then having some degree of resolution is a more mm. satisfying listen. Oh, definitely. And it gives the, uh, the listener sort of some sort of consistency, yeah. which, uh, given that pretty much all of life comes down to routine and habit and, and uh, a safety feeling of knowing what you're getting, yeah. that sort of has that advantage as well. But then there's sort of a niceness in, I don't want to say anarchy and having a longer mm. or a shorter thing, but it sort of feels like, you know, you're sort of taking a mild risk and you're still getting your reward. 
Yes, it you know can have a more organic feel. Yes, mm. absolutely. And you can clearly take lots of risks. You're not having to go through a commissioner. Mm. You're not. You don't have a, a, an executive editor type person um, giving you feedback. I mean, you know, if if your audience like it, they'll talk about it and pass it on to each other if they don't they won't bother downloading i suppose so you know yeah you can have a lot of fun and explore really creatively with podcasting so you know i think it's uh it's a great thing that it exists that's for sure why, why do you think the, the 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 comedy or some of the comedy listening uh, audience for why do you think the the comedy audience of podcast listeners don't consider radio four then like is it just that stigma we talked about before where it's kind of archers if, or yeah maybe maybe they sort of associate it perhaps with with their parents maybe or it's just maybe they don't listen to radio one or any radio at all they, they, maybe there's no radio in the house and they don't realize you can get it on uh, as an app i'm not sure uh, this is just based on one or two conversations recently of someone who is a big comedy fan likes a lot of live comedy listens to podcast but just hadn't really considered the radio at all um which is um I could sort of see when it was less flexible and you couldn't download stuff, but I, I couldn't really... I, we didn't go into too much detail about why exactly she wasn't aware of it. I mean, that, that's the trouble sometimes with radio is that you get a few lines in a magazine, if you're lucky, where you can plug radio shows, you know, and you trail ra- radio content, but often on that radio station itself rather than advertising it more broadly. So I suppose that's where social media is useful, is people who are fans of Taz Ilias, for example, or Daphne or Nish Kumar, if they or Lazy Susan, you know, if they say, oh, we've got a show on Radio 4, that will try and bring that audience over. Um, I asked them to everyone, quick fire for me, take as long as you want, but like you said, what? Are, so what's the best show you've ever seen? Best show I've ever seen? What? Or heard? Oh, in your case. blimey. Um, gosh. Um, I'm just going to say for this Edinburgh, because otherwise I'll just be here forever. Um, uh, I think Mr Swallow uh, Houdini by Nick Mohammed is the best show I've seen in Edinburgh so far. What is the biggest problem in radio comedy and how would you go about solving it? Uh not enough places to put our comedy is the thing we've got too too many great ideas and great talent and not enough space to put them so we just need i don't know another radio station startup to take comedy or more platforms really okay um would it not also link to the fact that people don't have more time in the day to listen to the content you put out yes (laughs) and what is the best bit of advice you've ever been given Oh, um, blimey. Oh, gosh. Um, or do you want me to flip it and say what's the best bit of advice you could give someone? Uh, yes, yeah. Wh- which way around yeah, is better for you? Uh, yeah, I suppose if I was to give advice to, to anyone, I'd just say be persistent, um, be resilient, you know, um, do your research and don't give up. If you, if you want to work in this industry, get as much experience as you can and take the initiative. And, you know, it's, it's you who've got responsibility for shaping your own destiny. So don't sit around moaning that you don't get the opportunities. Go and create them. Yeah, that's nice. Thank you very much for coming on. Pleasure. That was Julia. That was awesome. I've had a fair few number of TV people and writers on. I'm loving getting the radio perspective on the industry because it's something that is not seen as having as much kudos as you said in the podcast but they do get bigger audiences for me it's weird like that radio is such a personal medium and it's such a connection that you have with your audience that you can't really get with tv 